But see, he told me you used to go out with Steve. Is it true? We finger f***ed once last spring. That's it. It's all over now. What else? Well, I was wondering if I might have the chance if you wanted to go study with me. Not a chance. But... Sorry, Dawn, but that's like just the way it is. You don't cut it. What if I wore something? Dawn, look in the mirror. There comes a point in every child's life where they become aware of the world's perception of them. As young children, we are fiercely imaginative and unapologetically us. We don't have a sense of shame about our identities. Things like beauty and status don't mean anything to us because we aren't even aware of those things exist. But as we grow older, we tap into the world we live in. We learn what the world values, that it values beauty and intellect and status. And then we project those values onto ourselves. We learn that the way we look is not the standard of beauty admired and coveted by the masses. We think there's something wrong with us. We try to fix it with different clothes, with a different look. Fix it by being agreeable, by being quiet, by keeping our head down. Maybe then people will like us, but most of the time, they don't. Welcome to the Dollhouse was an unexpected gem when it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 1995. Recently, when I made my account for this year's festival, I answered the question, what's your favorite Sundance film with Welcome to the Dollhouse? And it only took me a second to come up with that answer because the movie resonated so deeply with me. Todd Solondz was the writer and director behind this movie about an awkward seventh grader doing her best to cope with being ignored at home, bullied at school, and an onslaught of new insecurities brought on by learning that she doesn't fit the societal standard of beauty. Played by a young and clever Heather Matarazzo, long before she dined on Genovian popcorn, Dawn is a quiet social outcast. Her last name is Wiener, so naturally all the kids in middle school take joy in calling her Wiener Dog when they aren't completely ignoring her existence. Dawn is lonely and she really just wants to be liked. She wants her parents to care about her, to notice her, and when she can't get that to work, she tries to get the attention of a high schooler. When her little sister Missy goes missing, Dawn is convinced that she was kidnapped and taken to New York, so she forms a plan to go to New York, save her sister, and then finally, she'll be the hero. Dawn, you're the best daughter a mother could have. I love you so much. I love you, Dawn. Me too. I love you. Oh, Dawn, I love you. Dawn, I love you. And you know, I've always loved you. Oh, Dawn, we love you. But even that doesn't work out. Dawn experiences humiliation after humiliation, rejection after rejection. All her attempts to simply be loved are foiled, and it's painful to watch. It brings back memories of middle school and the cruelty of children. Majority of the films about pre-adolescent years are tied to themes of levity, adventure, and true friendships. In these movies, kids may experience bullying and hard times, but the adventure they experience aids them in overcoming their tribulations. They conquer the danger of their quest, and now they can easily face their bully. On this adventure, they bond with people that will be their friends for life. These movies end on a hopeful note. That's part of what makes Welcome to the Dollhouse so different. It's a movie about middle school and the terror that comes with that awkward in-between of teenagedom and childhood. Although those are the themes, the movie isn't made for kids. It's too vulgar and way too bleak. It's for the people who have already been through it lived through that grueling age and lived to tell the tale. From high schoolers to retirees, the movie calls back not only the cruelty of burgeoning adulthood, but why it's so hard and such a strange thing. There are a lot of stories about leaving high school, going to college, leaving college, trying to, as they say, adult. These are the most common coming of age stories and yes, these stories are important and relatable, etc. But personally, when I recall the most pivotal and emotional moments of growing up, they're all memories from when I was 12 or 13. It's a tough fucking age. Things are changing, you're changing, maybe your family is changing, and sometimes it can be too much. For me, this was the age when I realized I didn't have many friends and started to question what was wrong with me. It was the age when looking in the mirror could make me cry. A lot of good things happened too. I learned to skateboard, I wrote stories without caring a lick about how nonsensical they were. I started to find out about me 
and before I knew it, all the bad stuff was behind me and the despair I felt is now just a faint memory. Something I can look back on with a bit of humor. Which perfectly describes Welcome to the Dollhouse. It's a bleak affair, but when you're looking back on it as an adult, it's kind of funny. Callum Baker wrote about the two contrasting worlds of childhood and adulthood in a piece called Welcome to the Dollhouse, the ultimate coming-of-age film. The complicated blend of typical on-screen childhood tropes with the more unsavory adult plot points becomes a rigorous commentary on just why growing up is so strange. Instead of trying to ingratiate itself into the viewer's very personal experiences, attempting to give some overbearing reassurance that it'll all turn out fine, it just joins you, an adult at the end of it all, to look back and wince. Instead of seeing the world as we want to see it, in the simplest terms, the most convenient definitions, it de-aestheticizes the whole experience and reflects anew with heightened realism. The simple fact that no matter how much we romanticize our teenage years and the people that were there for us, growing up is an intrinsically strange and lonely experience. Throughout Welcome to the Dollhouse, there seems to be no end to the despair. And that's kind of the point. When you're that age, you feel weighed down by the doom and the gloom. It's impossible to see a silver lining. You feel the helplessness that Dawn feels. And worse, the complacency. Because at that age, all you really can do is wait until you're older, until you're able to change things. There's a scene where Dawn does try to change things. She attempts to hit one of her bullies with a spitball. She misses and hits her teacher instead. And in the principal's office, Dawn explains, I was fighting back. Who ever told you to fight back? In a way, those bleak moments prepare you for how life can feel like a series of unfortunate events. Dawn is all of us at that age. The movie is an impressive feat and it's really a specialty of Todd Solon that he blends really, really dark, I mean dark, scenarios with these poignant social and psychological observations in comedy. For example, Brandon, a character who terrorizes Dawn and bullies her only friend Ralphie, threatens to her multiple times. It's one of those moments where the juxtaposition between childhood and the darker themes hits the hardest. Brandon continues to threaten Dawn, and Dawn continues to follow suit with his plans. Her relationship with him is toxic and shocking, but it's not a huge deviation from what movies have been telling women about relationships for decades. Movies and parents have told little girls that when a boy pulls their hair or pushes them, they like them. We teach them that violence is love. In a way, Brandon and Dawn become a parody of this. But I think marijuana should be legalized. Why do you always have to be such a cunt? Solens ridicules the dark undercurrent of middle school, of movies, and of suburban life by mirroring it and towing the line between parody and gritty realism. Welcome to the Dollhouse was one of the first of its kind and has undoubtedly influenced films like Bo Burnham's impressive directorial debut, Eighth Grade, and maybe even Mean Creek. Oh my god, you remember Mean Creek? But even before Nobody Knows and Welcome to the Dollhouse, there was one movie that set the standard for middle grade angst. <laughs> The 400 Blows, the iconic film from Francois Truffaut, was perhaps cinema's first look at the trials of early adolescence. The story follows Antoine Donnel, a 14-year-old who was misunderstood by his parents and teachers and authority figures. Arriving seven years before Robert Bresson's Mouchette and nearly ten years before L'Enfant Nu, Les Quatre Cent Coups, or The 400 Blows, was an instant classic. It was one of the big founders of French New Wave cinema. In the film, Antoine is a kid often left to his own devices. His mother and stepfather are often away, busy with work or with other people. They don't have the time to grant him attention or care. They're not the ruthless type. They're not cruel or violent, but the silence and the solitude is violence enough. School isn't much better. His teachers have given up on him, deciding he's not worth the effort, and he's nothing but a troublemaker. And Antoine's parents, who barely know him, rely on what others have to say about their son's character. So everyone thinks of him as a troublemaker, and Antoine goes with it. If everyone tells you you're going to turn out to be one thing, it's easy to start believing it, to just throw in the towel. Things go sour for him at every turn, and eventually, he ends up in a juvenile home, branded officially as the troublemaker everyone always made him out to be. Welcome to the Dollhouse is like Les Quatre Sans Coupe in many ways. 
Both lead characters are young teenagers on the cusp of adolescence, and both are beginning to understand their place in the world, a place not of their choosing but one carved out for them. Both are left to their own devices, all but abandoned by their parents and disregarded by their teachers. In my now unlisted video on Euphoria and the conventions of the teen drama, the video is fine, I guess. I go into detail about when movies started to center around and be catered to the teenage market and all that's fine. It's just that I made it two years ago and it doesn't really reflect all the complexities I feel about Euphoria now, so... Anyway, I've talked about how media for teenagers exploded onto the scene after Rebel Without a Cause. Since then, a lot of TV shows and movies about coming of age or growing up are about people from the ages of 15 to 19, honing in on those high school years. In America, these high school movies were steadily on their way to becoming all the rage. High School Hellcats in 1958, The Delinquents in 1957, the list goes on. And in France, at the tail end of that decade, Francois Truffaut was telling a different kind of story about growing up, and it turned out to be one of the best movies, and one of my favorite movies, of all time. In the years since The 400 Blows, we got films like Mouchette and L'Enfant Nu, but the cinema of pre-adolescent despair died down until 1995 with Welcome to the Dollhouse. In the years since, we've seen films like We Are the Best, All About Lily Choo Choo, Kid with a Bike, The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete, The Fits, and Eighth Grade. All films that focus on that particular uncomfortable age. Looking back on all the moments that shaped us with a new, inviting lens. In some of these features, you can see the influence Dollhouse had, but its influence has never been limited to this. You see glimpses of it in Saved, which is the best movie ever. I am filled with Christ's love! In Ghost World, Drop Dead Gorgeous, Election, I could go on. And all of these, every movie I just mentioned, scratch that, every single one I've mentioned in this video, is one that I highly recommend. And I can see Dollhouse's influence on some of these, even if it's just a slight glimmer, and I love that. I want to talk about Heather Matarazzo for a second. Her performance in the movie is absolutely stunning. I think even as a child, she had this empathy for the character she played that made all of her performances feel very genuine. Welcome to the Dollhouse did great things for Todd Solondz's career, and even for Matarazzo, briefly. The movie thrusted her into the limelight suddenly, but it came with the knowledge of how the world viewed her, and valued her. It was strange because I never thought about the characters that I played when I was younger, but it wasn't until I became an adolescent that I started hearing words such as ugly or plain. I started to get a firm grasp on how other people saw me, and I took other people's views of me as absolute truths. Her role as the awkward Dawn Wiener had her typecast as the nerdy girl, the outsider, the plain one, and it was something that affected the way she saw herself for years. But she never placed blame on the film or the character. Despite Dawn being a product of Solens' imagination, I'd argue that no one loves her more or has more respect for her than Heather. So in 2016, when Solens' film Wiener Dog came out, it stung when Matarazzo found out that Dawn Wiener would not only be making an appearance in the film, but that she was to be portrayed by Greta Gerwig. Through Twitter, she found this out on Twitter. Of course my ego was bruised. I found out about it on Twitter. I felt sad and hurt. But people grow and people change and that's part of life. I wanted to talk about that last part because Heather makes the film really click. She's perfect as Dawn, and she's my only Dawn Wiener, and that's that. Next! I'm Haley. I have a cat. Irrelevant. November 30th. Today was my birthday, and I got an American Girl doll. But Jackie said she already had that one. I hate her and her stupid face. Take her doll. Pop off her head! Special world, little girl. 